As you know, uh, we started a new series on prayer. Prayer. And we're looking at now, we're looking, we know we want to look at the disciples' prayer. And to the, looking at the disciples' prayer, we started with looking at Luke chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. It's, it's how it goes. Luke 11, 1 to 4. You have your Bibles, please send with me to Luke 11, 1 to 4. And it says, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Verse 2 says, And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So that's it. Look at level one to four. Now, in our series on the topic of prayer, we saw last week, if you recall, how the Old Testament people of Israel prayed. That's, you know, when they prayed, they followed God's original pattern for prayer, which we saw, if you recall, as one adoration, Two, thanksgiving. Three, recognition of God's holiness. Four, submission, which is also obedience. Five, confession. Six, corporate or collective prayer, which was also unselfish prayer because they had in mind the whole community. The whole community. And then the last one, the seventh one, perseverance or persistence. We started looking at John the Baptizer. Now, you know, here's what I think should be interesting. That John the Baptizer had also taught his disciples how to pray. Why did he do that? Because the kind of praying going on at the time was not God's model. And this tells us that John was a true Old Testament saint who could and knew how to pray. So he taught his disciples how to pray. Now, according to Luke, Luke chapter 7, you know, 18 to 24, Jesus' disciples had met with John's disciples. And John's disciples obviously must have told them that their teacher, John, was in fact teaching them how to pray. So, they were happy. You know, they were happy to learn how to pray. Now, it must have really been a unique experience. It must have been very different than the way all of them grew up hearing, you know, the people pray. So Jesus and disciples also wanted to know how to pray. So now finally here, we don't know how long, but at least we know the four chapters later after chapter 7 of Luke, the question was posed to Jesus by his disciples. It was one disciple who said, Lord, will you teach us to pray? So he spoke on behalf of all the disciples. And now, with that question, it was Jesus' turn to lay down the approach to prayer. You know, the real deal. And what does Jesus do? Jesus leads them and you and I today to the original part of the biblical way of praying. And I'm just studying it, it's amazing. Just studying, you know, what we call uh, the disciples' prayer is just mind-blowing. I mean, starting with our Father, you can ask what does it mean? It simply means to be a child of God. To be a child of God. And I'm talking about saved Christians. So you can stop right there at our Father and pray your way through everything you can think about our Father. I mean, we just celebrated Father's Day. So, so ask yourself, what does a serious earthly father do? I mean, look at it this way. In Genesis, in Genesis 1, 28, fatherhood was what? Was one of the first jobs God gave man. Immediately after he created Adam and Eve, what did he do? God commanded them, be fruitful and multiply. So when we pray and say, our father, we know that we belong to God because he created us and we're his offspring. He made us in his image. When we pray and say, our father, we can pray for fathers, for men, you know, for males in our lives. We, we can pray for the right relationships. 
you know, when we pray our Father, we can say, you know, pray for Father Child, Savior, Sin, Provider, Receiver. I mean, you know, we can even reflect on what it means to be a child of God when we pray our Father. See, matter of fact, there's so much to pray on our Father alone that you could pray for hours just focusing on the many aspects of a dad. A good dad, by the way. The right dad. Now, what are some of the attributes of a real good father? A good father is a provider, a protector. A good father is, re is really a lover of what? His wife and children. He also admires his wife and children. A true good father knows that his role is not just biological, you know, you, you, you know what I mean, being the male, uh, what do you call it, genetic uh, contributor to the creation of a baby, you know, whether, whether it's through marriage, sexual intercourse, sperm donation or whatever. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, you know, and just in case, please remember that we are learning about how God intended for us to pray. And even Jesus' closest friends, the disciples, also wanted to know how to pray. So our Father is critical. Starting with our Father is important. Now, looking at our main text in Luke, Luke 11, did you notice Jesus' careful choice of words here? He did not say, my Father, but he said, our Father. And you know, when we look at our world in our individualistic age where the focus is always on me, myself, and I, even faith in our God gets spoken of as my relationship with my God. My God. Well, my God. But look at it differently. Christ reminds us that one of the best ways to enjoy our relationship with God is to experience a with and in a community of faith. Now, what about which art in heaven? It's the same thing. From which art in heaven alone, so much can be prayed. So much. It means we all pray to our faithful father, Abba. You know, who lives in heaven, but it's everywhere because he's, he's what? Omnipresent. And you know, you know, you know, God likes it when we call him Abba Father. But Abba, I'm not talking about the rock group, you know, from Sweden, no. I'm talking about Abba, God, our Heavenly Father. He wants us to talk to him just like we talk to our earth, earthly fathers. And as we can see from the rest of the prayer we hear, here, God, you know, in God who in James 1, 17 says is the father of lies, the father of spirits, according to Hebrews 12, 9, and the father of glory, according to Ephesians 1, 17, who is in heaven is not a distant deity at all. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. We can see from the fact, you know, from the rest of the prayer that God in James 1, 17 is called father of lies. In Hebrews 12, 9, it's called what? The father of spirits. Ephesians 1, 17 calls him father of glory. And even though he's in heaven, he's not a distant date at all. He's as close as the mention of his name. I mean, we are in him in the manner that reflects a relationship that we can truly describe as a bond of tender supremacy. I love that. See that? Now, another thing to note, another thing to note is that the first elements of the disciples' prayer are about God and his glory, and the second is about man and his nature. So first of all, when Christ taught his disciples, the first part is about God, the second part is of man, our needs. And, and you know, this really refers to having the right attitude in prayer. When we pray, say, our Father, we're expressing an unselfish spirit, and in the word our, we can see a link, a recognition of a family spirit, because our Father talks about intimacy, uh, and also community. See that? About the personal life that God's given to us. So prayer starts with the glory of God before turning to human interest or need. That's the first priority. God. Now, the, the other thing I want us to note is that we must learn when we pray, our prayer must begin and end with God. That's what the disciples' prayer show. That's how Jesus prayed. 
That's what they heard him pray. As we study this prayer, for sure, we will never be able to say this prayer or recite it again in the same way. We won't have a, a better understanding of, of the disciples' prayer. Okay? So Jesus began by saying, Our Father who art in heaven. And when we say who art in heaven, it means we remember God's holiness and glory, that he's also a God of majesty and dominion. He's the most high God. I mean, look at what the Bible says. The, the, the second, uh, second Chronicles 20 verse it says, O oh Lord God of our Father, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the of, of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? That's the who art in heaven. That's the who art in heaven. He's, he's not only in heaven. He rules over all. The, he rules over all the kingdoms of of, of the nations. And and, and as, as as it says, he's uh, you know in his hand is is power. Might and nobody's able to, to withstand him. That's the who art in heaven. He's the highest, the most high, which also means that he is the creator of all things in heaven and on earth. So, since the Lord is most high, it means that no idol, no God, anything fashioned by, by the hand of man or any created being can be worshipped. May be worshipped or exalted above the Lord because God our Father He is superior in every way. The Lord alone, none else, is to be the highest object of our worship. I mean, from heaven, He sees everything because He governs all the nations. And the whole prayer is social. See what I mean? That's why Jesus focused on community. You see? That's why he says, ow, 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 us. And, and remember too, when Jesus was here on earth, he was limited to one geographical locality. However, when he ascended back to heaven, first he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell his people. And secondly, he is in more places at once working at the same time. What else? While he was on earth, many of his miracles were physical and in nature and limited to where he where he was. Now look at what look at what you and I experience. He uses all of us, his children, the saved ones to bring the word of salvation to, to, to those who are lost. So when Jesus taught his disciples, we must understand the, the importance of our Father who art in heaven. He oversees everything. Then Jesus added, Hallowed be thy name. This is the first supplication or the you know the first petition or the first request in the prayer. Now, do you see what it means? Hallowed be thy name. It tells us the purpose of prayer. Prayer isn't about you, it's about me. Prayer isn't about us. You know, some teach that prayer is about us, you know, how to order, command God. No matter the high, you know, I mean, no matter the type of prayer or the urgent need to pray, hello be thy name means that first prayer is about hallowing our Father who art in heaven. It means, I mean, what, what it means is that prayer is for God, not for us. I mean, let me say that again. Prayer is for God, not for us. It is for God to show his amazing and awesome glory through what? Meeting our needs. And by the way, not our ones, meeting our needs. I mean, look at what the Bible says, John 14, 13. It says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see that? That's why I say praise about God and not about us. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. You, you see that? You see what Jesus said in John 14, 13? I mean, true prayer in Jesus' name always has this goal, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That is the purpose of prayer. That is the object of prayer. It, you know, and these greater works that Jesus mentioned means that prayers prayed with a passion for the glory of Jesus and God the Father will truly be in the name of Jesus and be the kind of prayer God will answer. 
We the kind of prayer that God would answer. Bringing glory to God, you know, both the Father and the Son. I mean, that's, it's as simple as that. By the way, the word hallowed, right? It means to set apart, to be holy. It is to say that there is no one like God. That he's completely holy. He's completely unique. He's, I mean, I mean he's not just a super person or, 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 or a better being. No. You know. And, and, and when it says, and thy name, hallowed be thy name. Thy name refers to God's whole character. This is very important. The totality of his person. And remember, he is set apart. Hallowed. Holy. Most high. Separate. So if, he, if God is, if our Father is all this, then true prayer is really coming into His presence simply to submit to His will. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. It's all about God. See, prayer is all about God. It all tells us that first it is about God's plan, His agenda. And then, you know, it tells us to have a passion for God's glory and God's agenda. In other words, what I'm saying is that his name, his kingdom coming, and his will being down on earth as it is in heaven should have the top priority in our prayers. So it's not for us to put our agenda first. No. But sadly, sadly, that's what's happening today. You know, that's what's happened today where true religion, the true faith of the church, as you know, as we read about in the book of Acts, have been overtaken by deceptive churches. False churches which are led by religious hypocrites. So what do we say today? You know it. Just flip on your TV. Check out the internet. Look at other social media sites. And what do you do? You hear messages and you know, yeah, messages that immediately tells you that that today prayer is only formulas and rituals and vain repetitions. You see, repetitions that, that that's what will happen, and that's why Jesus, that's why John taught his disciples how to pray, and the disciples said, "Lord, teach us to pray." So today, look, I mean, I mean, look at it. Today, you hear catchy phrases like, you know, your miracle is in your mouth. Name it and claim it. We give life to what. We speak. We are in charge. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's just incredibly astonishing, you know, the extent to which so-called Christians flippantly flock to these carries program. You know what carries program? Carries program. Carries program is uh, the, 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 a word that I formulated. Carries being what? Uh, uh, the gift and program uh, what? Abuse. So carries program is uh, abusing Grace abusing gifts. That's what it is. So these, you know, people people flock to this carriage program, fully believing that God is a genie who's standing by at their beck and call, ready to answer and give them anything they ask. So, you, so you see people flocking to these these this carriage program, giving all they have because they have an expectation that God is going to meet their needs. Meanwhile, prayer is about God. Prayer is about God. See, so these carries program are adept at picking and twisting single verses to suit their ungodly purposes. But look at the disciples' prayer that we're looking at right now. It begins and ends with the supremacy of our Father, Abba. And I want to end now. It begins, I mean, the disciples' prayer begins with God's supremacy, it ends with God's supremacy. And even in the middle of this prayer, where it says, Thy will be done, the focus is on God, where we submit, where we surrender, where we acknowledge that God is in control, that He is above all, He is the Most High God, and His name is hallowed. So the disciples saw Jesus pray, and they didn't want to pray like the Pharisees and the scribes who recited, you know, heartless. Almost mindless mumbo jumbo prayers. So, as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, the disciples, his disciples approached him, and one of them said, 
I want to learn how to pray. You know, it, it, it seemed like they were it, it was, it was dropping on Jesus, right? And all they wanted was, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. And what about us today? What about us today? Lord, teach us to pray. Do you want to know how to pray? Do you want the Lord to teach you how to pray? I want our church, we want the Lord to teach us how to pray. And he will if we go to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. He's taught us already. He's given us a model. You, you've heard him this morning. You've heard all that I have to say. Maybe you're not a believer. This is how you become a believer, a Christian, a true Christian, if you pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I haven't given my life to Christ. Today, I want to be a child of God. I believe that Jesus Christ came into this world died on the cross for my sins. I believe in my heart and I confess him with my mouth that he is my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you pray this prayer, we would love to hear from you because this is what makes you a Christian. The moment say I want to hear from you is to help you grow in the Lord, show you what the next steps are. And if you're not a Christian, if, if, and if you are a believer, see the model prayer that the Lord told us? Prayer is about him. So when we go to God in prayer, let us first remember that he is. He is the hallowed one. And we present everything to him. And he in turn will take care of us. Amen. Shall let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for, for today. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for teaching us how to pray. We know, mighty God, we've been so selfish in the way we pray over the years. Today, mighty God, we want to start afresh with you. As we go into your word, give us the understanding that we need so we can pray and pray effectively and pray better. So your name will be glorified. So we can advance your kingdom right here on earth as well. We thank you. We glorify you. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name for his sake. Amen. Amen. May God bless you all.